Blanche Ash, longtime friends of MCC. He was the first Board of Trustee Chair for a college, also the first chair of our foundation as a college. Uh, through his wonderful gifts, we have the Science Building on this campus, the Technology and Learning Center at the Greenville campus, and uh, many of our cultural events are made possible because of their benevolence. And so we are thankful today that they have made this or what it is as a reality. Uh, today we have a very special guest with us. Dr. Matthew Rojanski is a graduate of Harvard, undergraduate. Uh, his doctorate is from Stanford. Uh, he directs a think tank in Washington, D.C., blocks away from the White House, called the Kennan Institute. It's a part of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. It was uh, uh, devised in 1972 and 1974 uh, for a man whose name was George Kennan the Elder, a 19th century explorer of Russia and Siberia. And the center's mission is to increase American knowledge uh, of Russia and uh, Ukraine, Siberia, and that part of the world. He is an expert uh, on U.S. relations with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, he speaks around the country and internationally. He is quite well known, uh, and we're absolutely thrilled to have him today to address us. He will speak uh, from now until about 20 till. Uh, he will allow about 10 minutes for questions and answers. When that time comes, I'll let you moderate your own questions, sir. You can feel free to have them from the floor. I would suggest that when you ask a question, you stand where you are and ask your question as loudly as you can. Uh, and then at 10 till, we will dismiss and adjourn formally. Uh, but if you have no class, then you can stay for a few minutes and ask questions personally. You may certainly feel free to do that. Uh, so we're delighted to have you here at Dr. Rochansky. Uh, you have been a real delight. Uh, to be on our campus, and we're just so thrilled to have you. Uh, thanks for being here today. The podium is yours, sir. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again, Gary. Gary's been a phenomenal host here in Western Michigan, my first time in this part of the state. Um, I've been told not to say that I've been to Detroit before and imply by that that I know anything about Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't. Uh, I have been to Siberia before, though, so I consider this pretty balmy. Um, <laughs> I want to thank uh, everyone here at MCC, uh, Bob Ferentino in particular, thanks for having me. Um, I want to greet the alumni who are watching. I'll try and stay more or less in front of the camera here. Um, now, I have to confess, uh, there's maybe a bit of false advertising in the then and now aspect here, because a lot of what I want to talk to you about uh, hasn't even happened yet. Uh, it's frankly breaking news at this very moment. Uh, it's issues that are going to be affecting the security of Europe, uh, the security of the United States, and of the entire world uh, in the coming weeks and months. And I hope that some of what I suggest, in fact, doesn't come to pass. Uh, it'll be better for all of us, but we'll have to wait and we'll have to see. Uh, but I will talk to you about history as well, because history is important context to understand what's going on in this region today. Um, and I like to begin by, uh, by quoting something that my very first professor of Soviet history uh, in college said to me, and that's that history is not really a discipline. It's not a science. Um, it's not even an art. It's really just sort of a knack. It's something that you pick up and something that you do, because it's everywhere and it's everything. So in fact, what is history? History is everything that happened right up until this moment. And I think when, when you think about what I'm about to tell you about Russia and Ukraine, you have to understand it as part of a centuries, even millennia long history, something that's been going on far longer than any of us have been alive, far longer than the Cold War, far longer than television coverage and media. Uh, far longer than, than formal teaching. Uh, this is a very ancient story and it's manifesting itself today. So let me begin though in the not so distant past. Uh, in the spring of two years ago, when I was living in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, uh, an ancient, beautiful European city, with my family. I was conducting research about corruption in the Ukrainian economy um, with the support of a U.S. government fellowship program, and I was working for the U.S. Embassy. And Kiev at that time was peaceful and beautiful, nothing like the images that we saw 
uh, last fall and winter for the violence, uh, some of which I'll show you shortly here. Uh, but it was very much an unrest. People had poured out into the streets on one particular day in May, and I have a photo of it that, that I actually took here, um, in the thousands. Uh, up to 30,000 people had poured out in the streets, and this was a regular occurrence. Every few weeks, every couple of months, there would be a major protest on the streets of Kiev. So why were they doing this? Well, the answer is simple. The situation in Ukraine over the past five years was absolutely desperate because of the corruption of Viktor Yanukovych, the former president of the country. Now, he had been freely and fairly elected in a democratic election recognized by the United States and the whole world as such. Uh, but then he did an awful lot of things uh, to deprive Ukrainian people of not only their basic freedoms uh, in a political sense, uh, but also their welfare and their well-being. So as an example, this is the view from the center of Kiev, uh, from Marinsky Park, which is next to a beautiful old Tsarist palace, uh, next to the parliament building. It overlooks the Dnieper River, which flows through Kiev and is sort of the defining geographic feature of Ukraine. Um, and he interfered with that view, molested it really, by, by building this horrific, uh, gigantic helicopter landing pad and conference center, uh, which he built so that he could fly to his private mansion, which he also built on public land. He confiscated about 400 acres of public park land uh, and then built this mansion at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. And mind you, his official salary was less than $100,000 a year. So all of this was stolen money. Um, now, it has a bit of a rustic sort of feel to it, the log cabiny aspect. Um, take my word for it, it was not at all rustic. I was able to go inside it uh, a few months after his downfall last February, um, and you find this sort of thing inside uh, custom mosaics done by uh, world-renowned artists, uh, gold inlay everywhere, gold-plated items all throughout, uh, private bowling alleys, private boxing rings, uh, several uh, elaborate billiard rooms, and of course, your own private floating pirate ship restaurant. <laughs> Every president should have it. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, a, a private chapel in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. You can see the priceless ancient icons that he had removed from churches and monasteries around Ukraine and put into his private chapel, and then everything is done in gold and mother of pearl and amber. Um, and then, of course, his uh, gatekeeper stuffed lion uh, guarding his I joke not, his girlfriend's private massage parlor and nail salon, which was attached to his palace. Again, every president should have one. The lion, I mean, not the girlfriend. And then his collection of uh, exotic cars and animals, uh, old Soviet and Western military vehicles, old Soviet and American cars. Uh, it was a very strange place to find a classic GM automobile. Uh, in the middle of Ukraine, but perfectly preserved and perfectly maintained, uh, almost all of them in running condition. And then, of course, exotic animals, none of which have any business in Kiev, but there they were in his private zoo. And I asked, by the way, I asked one of the staff who was still there, Lord knows why they were still there after the downfall of Yanukovych, no one was paying them, but I suppose they didn't want the animals to starve. I asked him, what, what did he do? Did he, I mean, it's not like he didn't have little kids. Was he coming here with balloons and cotton candy to look at the animals? And they said one word, Miasa which means meat in Russian. So all those animals were there to be served to his guests. Um, but the corruption, of course, was on an institutional scale as well. I mean, that stuff is funny, but uh, it's not funny that when Ukraine hosted the European Soccer Championships in 2012, jointly with Poland, a neighboring country and a member of the European Union, they spent roughly twice as much per seat to build the stadiums, to build the infrastructure, to run the game. So where do you think the difference of hundreds of millions of dollars went? obviously, into the pockets of officials. And then, of course, Yanukovych, uh, the former president of Ukraine, uh, became famous uh, for publishing a couple of books which no one had ever heard of, uh, released by publishers which no one had ever heard of. Um, and the purpose of these books was simply to have a book contract so that he could funnel money into his pockets and, uh, and have uh, private businesses pay him tens or hundreds of millions of dollars as honoraria for writing these books. Professors, pay attention. Always a good idea. Um, so, so why did the protest movement change? Why did it become so dramatic and significant? In late November of uh, 2013, uh, Yanukovych was due to sign an agreement. It wasn't a particularly important agreement. 
It was called an association agreement with the European Union. Very bureaucratic. It would not have transformed Ukraine by any means, certainly not in the short term. But it was seen as deeply symbolic by the Ukrainian people because in the midst of just this endemic and overwhelming corruption of the last several years, and it's not only the Yanukovych period. They had been living with corruption for the 25 years since independence in 1991, and then a different kind of corruption all throughout the Soviet era when it wasn't really about monetary wealth, it was about power and privilege and whether you were connected to the Communist Party. So these are people who had been just absolutely swimming in corruption for decades, if not for a century, uh, and then even for centuries before that in the Tsarist times. Um, and so they thought of the European Union as emblematic of a different way of living, right? This is the chance to live like they do in Germany, or like they do in France, or the United Kingdom, or Poland. All places that they thought of as being far more developed, uh, places where there was a rule of law, where you could go to a court and get a judgment enforced to protect your interests. So what Yanukovych did was he promised that he would sign the agreement, and then he changed his mind. And at the end of November of 2013, Yanukovych announced that in fact he wouldn't sign the agreement, and tens of thousands of people poured out into the streets. Now, the central square of Kiev is called the Maidan. Maidan just means square in the Ukrainian language. Um, and they occupied this square for a number of days. Fundamentally, their demands were straightforward. They just wanted Yanukovych to sign the agreement and to go back to this vision that they had of a light at the end of the tunnel. He, of course, refused. Something in particular changed on the night of November 30th. The crowds were actually beginning to disperse. There were really only a few hundred people left, but those people were young people, students mostly, uh, who were camped out outside one of the government buildings. And someone, sometime that night of November 30th, 2013, ordered heavily armed riot police to clear the area of these students. And so uh, a bunch of young people were beaten up. And the very next day, Ukrainians turned up en masse to protest and they began posting on Facebook and using technological tools like social networks, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, to try and coordinate uh, their, uh, their protest movement on the streets because they were so angry that the government had beaten up these young people and it refused to sign the agreement. Here you can see the correlation between the key dates in the protest movement, the night of December 30th to early, uh, then, excuse me, the night of November 30th to early December, and then on into January, and I'll talk later about what happened in mid-January. And you can actually see the correlation between Twitter usage in Ukraine and what was going on in the protest movement. So it's very clear that for the first time, really, um, even much more so than Tahrir Square in Egypt or other so-called Twitter revolutions, that this was a revolution driven very much by social networks. But at that time, it wasn't quite a revolution, and in part it was because of intimidation by the government. You see, technology can cut both ways. Um, if you were a protester in the center of Ukraine uh, sometime in December or January, you might have received this message on your iPhone screen, loosely translated, it says, uh, Dear subscriber, you have been registered as a participant in mass demonstrations. Uh, which is not a very pleasant thing to see when you know that the authorities know who you are and where you are and you're on a list. So technology cuts both ways. It helped the protesters organize and come out into the streets, but it also helped the authorities keep track of who was there and potentially intimidate people. Was it successful? It clearly wasn't. Thousands of people remained in the Maidan, and all through the coldest months of December and January, uh, people were really expressing their displeasure with the government, demanding justice uh, against these uh, riot police who had beaten up these kids, against senior people in the government who had ordered it, but still not making political demands, still not saying Yanukovych, the president, had to go. Then what changed? In the middle of January of last year, the parliament passed a series of so-called dictatorship laws. This was an attempt to break up the protest movement by force of law. Uh, I think of this as essentially the anti-Bill of Rights. You can be put in prison for showing disrespect for an elected official, for a court. You're not allowed to distribute pamphlets. You're not allowed to speak your mind. You're not allowed to assemble in large groups. You're not allowed to put a tent on the street, and on and on and on. So essentially everything that the protesters had been doing up until then was declared illegal. Now this was adding insult to injury. And so the protesters reacted in the way that is now famous of the Maidan protest. They became violent. This was the moment in the middle of January, snow on the streets of Kiev, that they began to erect barricades, literally pulling cobblestones up from the streets and building practically brick fortifications, blocking off the roads. 
They would burn out buses and use those as part of the fortifications. They created permanent tent encampments on the streets. And of course, they set a lot of things on fire and clashed with the authorities. Now, strangely and surreally, by the way, as all of this is happening, the rest of the city of Kiev is living completely normally. This is only in the very center, the central square of the city, where there's a clash with the authorities. This picture I like in particular, um, several burned out vehicles, including a bus that had been used to bring the uh, riot police uh, into the center of the city, born, burned out by the protesters, and then spray painted garbage truck on the front. Um, cynical sense of humor there. So this is the state of the city uh, in the middle of February of last year. Um, the center of the city, it's a low-lying area between a valley, between two uh, hills in orange there, completely occupied by the protesters. And the amazing thing, you could actually watch this live streaming video, and since I had lived there, my family actually lived uh, right down here, just, just south of the last of the protesters' barricades, and I used to jog all up and down uh, these streets here. Um, by the way, this up here in the upper right-hand corner, that is the Dnipro River. So the view that I was talking about that was destroyed was, was right here. Um, so the protesters are encamped in the center of the city. They're erecting barricades. The authorities are up on the government hill there in blue. Um, it was amazing to watch literally as uh, armored vehicles, heavily armed uh, riot police, soldiers with uh, heavy weapons are all assembling, marching around these city streets, modern city streets, right? There are like street cafes with soldiers tramping back and forth in front of them. Really unreal to see this in the center uh, of a beautiful modern European city. And yet that's what was happening. And then something else changed. No one knows to this day who gave the order, but by late February, uh, highly trained expert snipers firing from the high ground began taking out civilians uh, in, in the protest crowd down below. Uh, and the casualties mounted. At first it was a dozen, then a couple of dozen, then over 100 people. Um, and this is very much the kind of classic story of protest and martyrdom, right? These people became heroes, and the rest of the crowd was really inflamed. And so then what had been largely a peaceful protest or a minimally violent protest largely apolitical became exclusively political. It became about removing the regime, mounting a revolution, changing the government, and of course it became violent. Molotov cocktails, weapons of all kinds, the people charging up the streets uh, and seeking to physically remove the government from power. At the very 11th hour, a group of European diplomats comes to Kiev and helps to broker an agreement between Yanukovych, who's pictured here on the right-hand side, looking somewhat grim, given that he's about to lose his grip on power, and some of the opposition leaders, including this man, Vitaly Klitschko, who happens to be a professional boxer and is now mayor of Kiev, uh, speaking on behalf of the protesters, even though the reality is opposition politicians didn't necessarily represent the protest movement, but they took advantage of the opportunity. Uh, the deal was struck, and uh, most people expected that it would hold, that for at least a few weeks or a few months, Yanukovych would remain as president, the Maidan protests would calm down, uh, a special election would be held, and they could broker a kind of peaceful transition of power to new leadership. Well, that was not meant to be, uh, because that very night, Yanukovych returns to his palace, the one that I showed you earlier. Uh, you can see the truck in the background. He fills up uh, three uh, big cargo trucks filled with treasures, uh, artwork. I literally saw frames where you know he and his and his security had just sliced the art, the priceless art, out of the frames, items, whatever else he could carry with him. Uh, threw it in the trucks, and he leaves and goes to Russia. So the entire deal falls apart. There is no framework for a peaceful transition, and a new government is declared, and the revolution ah, is a great success, and Ukraine has a new government. But then something else happens, because life is never simple, and Russia becomes involved. This is where Crimea first starts to be an issue. Now we're in late, late February and early March. Now Crimea is a peninsula hanging down into the Black Sea from mainland Ukraine. Being a peninsula, it's very easy to cut off at a couple of choke points that are no bigger than a couple of kilometers. And Russian troops, who all the way since Soviet times, in fact since Russian imperial times, had been stationed at the Sevastopol Navy base, which is down here. And they continued to be stationed after 1991, after Russian and Ukrainian independence, they struck an agreement whereby uh, the two naval fleets were both based in Sevastopol together, and they actually got along just fine for most of those 25 years. 
But it did mean that you had tens of thousands of Russian troops on Ukrainian soil. And these troops began to fan out across Crimea, occupying critical locations. This is where the notion of the little green men that you might have heard about from last year came in. Uh, why little green men? Because they were wearing what were clearly Russian military uniforms. They clearly had Russian official military weapons. They were following Russian tactics and Russian strategy. They were speaking Russian. They were acting like Russian, right? So they quacked like ducks. But they weren't necessarily ducks because they had removed the insignia from their uniforms. It's the first time we've really ever seen something quite this blatant happen. And of course, Moscow officially denied that it had sent forces into Crimea, um, though it maintained that it had the right to do so if it wanted to. So it was this kind of surreal situation, uh, a denial of the reality that was unfolding before people, until soon enough, by the middle of March, Putin does acknowledge that there are Russian forces, and he says, and now Crimea is Russian territory, following a referendum that was thrown together at the last minute, claiming 90% of the population had voted to join Russia, Crimea is annexed, boom, it's removed and sliced off of Ukraine. What comes next? So Crimea is gone. Why did Crimea succeed so quickly? Well, in part because it was overwhelmingly ethnic Russian. Going all the way back to the 19th century, when Crimea was the site of the great battles uh, of the Crimean War, in which Russia fought against the European powers, um, many Russians died defending Sevastopol Harbor. It is seen as a kind of heroic, storied location in Russian history, and it is peopled primarily by Russians, by Russian-speaking ethnic Russians, and many people who identify very strongly with the Soviet past uh, because of the military connection as well. Now, the rest of Ukraine is kind of a mixed story. Here you can see the darker, the blue color, uh, the more ethnic Russians or Russian speakers or generally people who associate with Russia. Whereas the lighter colored areas here in gray, these are areas that are more Ukrainian. That is, they speak Ukrainian or in some cases other languages like Hungarian. They tend to be more connected with the rest of Europe. Here Ukraine borders on other countries like Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, etc., all of which are now part of the European Union. So very, very different attitudes. Ukraine has been a very divided country, and in many ways it's a country that was sort of stitched together by accident during Soviet times. The famous story, of course, is that Khrushchev literally transferred the Crimean Peninsula from Russia to Ukraine, but he did so within the Soviet Union. So it's the idea, you know, it's like if the upper peninsula of Michigan was somehow transferred to Illinois, right? Well, you know, it would suck for Michigan, but on the other hand, it wouldn't really change the shape of the United States. But what if the United States ceased to exist, right? And these became independent states. It would matter a whole lot. And so the perspective of the Russians living in Crimea was, hey, we were always Russians. And we kind of looked the other way when you did this, Khrushchev. But on the other hand, we don't want to be part of this modern Ukraine. And in particular, we don't want to be a part of a modern Ukraine in which there's been an anti-Russian revolution. And this is where the narrative really begins, that the West has sponsored what happened in Ukraine, that it's some kind of nationalist propaganda coup against Russians. And so the Russians begin to hold rallies and protests and referendums of their own all throughout eastern Ukraine, in which uh, there's a push for independence. Now, most of the world is not paying attention to this until July of last year. And that's when, in a very unfortunate, once again, Malaysian airliner, after losing an airliner somewhere over the Indian Ocean, the Malaysians again very ill-advisedly send an airliner flying from Amsterdam across Ukraine. Why across Ukraine, by the way? Because Ukraine is enormous. It's the biggest country in Europe. Few people realize this. 45 million people by territory bigger than France. This is an enormous, enormous country, and it is literally in between most of Europe and Asia, and certainly the Middle East. So if you're flying across Europe, chances are you're transiting Ukraine. So they foolishly do fly over Ukraine, and they fly in particular over the combat zone. Uh, and what we know for sure is that a missile that took down this plane was launched from rebel-held territory. We don't know who fired it. We don't necessarily know where the missile came from. But we know that it was launched from rebel-held territory. And this suddenly galvanized world opinion on what was going on in Ukraine, because the victims on that flight, many of them were European citizens. And this sort of brought the conflict home to roost for Western Europe, uh, and with that for the United States. Now, what's been happening since then is essentially irregular guerrilla warfare. And I like to show this image because it demonstrates for you that on neither side is it regular soldiers fighting, right? There are some, but by and large, most of the fighting is being done by these folks who are variously described as volunteers all the way to terrorists. Literally, the Ukrainian, the new Ukrainian government 
has described its campaign against the pro-Russian separatists as an anti-terrorist operation, right? Governments like to call people that they disagree with terrorists. Um, but in reality, you, you tell me who the terrorists are and who are the volunteer defenders of national sovereignty, right? And unfortunately, they're all using the same tactics. They're firing from civilian buildings. They're using these massive, unaimed artillery missile barrages, um, something known during World War II as a Katyusha rocket. It's basically a, it's a terror weapon. And the result is the same. It's the total destruction of the civilian infrastructure of this, this region of Ukraine, known as the Donbass, which had in fact previously been one of the wealthiest regions and most developed in the country. One of the saddest stories is the destruction of the Donetsk airport. This was built during that soccer championship that I mentioned in 2012 at a cost of a billion dollars. This was a major international airport. Um, it had you know, duty-free shops and fantastic restaurants, and I specifically remember a Porsche Cayenne Turbo SUV. It was like a $200,000 SUV in the middle of the airport with a little, you know, you can win this if you blah, blah, blah. And just like any other airport you can imagine anywhere in the world. This is what it looks like now. Totally obliterated in the fighting. The runway is destroyed. It's of no value to anyone. Uh, and yet they've been fighting over it literally until two weeks ago. Um, and dozens of people have been killed fighting for this, this empty, destroyed hulk. And then, of course, the Russian troops, as we've been hearing about in the news, continue to pour over the Ukrainian border. Uh, the details of this are, are a little bit foggy. The Ukrainians claim there are 10,000 Russian regular soldiers with hundreds of tanks and so on. You know, that's very unlikely, simply because those would be very hard to hide. The reality is that there probably are a few hundred, maybe a couple of thousand regular Russian troops, but that at any time the Russians can send forces over the Ukrainian border and they can pull them back. So, why is Russia doing this? What does Vladimir Putin want from all of this? Uh, I think there are three major reasons, and contrary to what you might think, they don't start with lines on a map and with geopolitics and NATO and European Union and things like that. They start with Putin's rule at home in Russia and his survival. Putin runs a system in which there is no peaceful succession. When Putin is done, he's done. And what that means is he has to retain power by convincing people that without him, they would be much worse off. They would return to the kind of chaos that they experienced during the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, when Russians were extremely poor, uh, when the grocery store shelves were empty, when the currency was wildly, rampantly inflated. Not like today, right? Today you have inflation maximum of you know, 50, 75% in Russia. In the 1990s, they, incurred, they experienced 1,000% inflation, right? The currency became essentially worthless. So Putin's story is very simple, and that is, if you depose me the way that Ukrainians deposed Yanukovych, a man who superficially seems very similar to Putin, right? They're both democratically elected, but very authoritarian-leaning. They both have a strong Soviet past. They're both Russian speakers and so on, two countries that have been closely linked. But if you remove me, Russia, the way that your Ukrainian neighbors removed Yanukovych, your life's gonna get real bad real fast. And that's why for Putin, the intervention in Ukraine is a way of ensuring that life in Ukraine gets bad and stays bad. Because if the opposite happened, if Ukraine then did sign the European Association Agreement and life got better in Ukraine, then the message would be very unfortunate for Mr. Putin. Moreover, Putin's credibility is at stake. This is reason number two. This is kind of the idea of Putinism. He has told a story about what happened in Ukraine that sounds very different from the story that I just told you about popular protests. His story starts with a CIA plot to try to destabilize the Ukrainian government, an alliance between the West and neo-Nazis, fascists, of which there are plenty in Ukraine, right? There's, there's factual evidence for this. And here, in fact, I like to point out Oleg Tanibok, leader of one of the Ukrainian opposition parties that was very much a part of the protest movement. There he is giving the Nazi salute. There he is shaking the hands of John McCain, right? So there, there is kind of superficial evidence for this case that Putin makes to the Russian people that what happened in Ukraine was a CIA-backed coup by neo-Nazi Ukrainian fascists designed to commit genocide against Russians. That's the story, and he's sticking to it. And his credibility depends on sticking to that story. And it's worked very well for him until now. His popularity has spiked. 
here you can see, and, and the chart's a little bit old, but its popularity is now even above where it was in March. It's now close to 90%, right? Numbers that an American leader can't even dream about. And even if you discount those numbers and you say, well, people don't answer surveys, honestly, fine, discount it by 50%, it's still incredibly popular, right? So Putin is far and away more popular than he was before. He experienced this, by the way, in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia. Nationalism sells. The boogeyman sells, right? So the idea that Russia is a, a justified war sells, and it sells even if nothing else is selling in the economy. This is the irony. We in the United States think, well, if the Russian economy tanks, then we really don't have anything to worry about because Putin will lose power. Not so. The Russian economy has been tanking for the last nine months. Putin is more popular than he's ever been. And part of that is because his popularity really does transcend the kind of real factors, the real economics that we mostly think about when we go to the polls in the United States. He has become a kind of divinity in Russia, right? Uh, the old name for, for Tsar in Russia was Bakta, the little father. Uh, God is the big father, the Tsar is the little father. And that really is the role that Putin plays in Russia today. Now, the third reason for Putin's intervention in Ukraine is, in fact, geopolitical. There's a positive side of this, which is that he's trying to build a sort of an alternate to the European Union for post-Soviet countries called the Eurasian Union. And it's not crazy, right? Former Soviet countries have a lot of stuff in common. They all speak Russian. Uh, they have the same educational system. That means they respect one another's degrees, right? We know how important that is, that your degree is accredited, that it's respected, et cetera. Um, they have the same manufacturing systems. They have the same supply chains. Uh, they have transportation infrastructure in common. So his argument is Ukraine should join Russia in an economic union instead of trying to join with Europe, where it will simply be treated as the redheaded stepchild and always be seen as corrupt and dysfunctional. There's also a negative dimension, and that's the argument that NATO expansion has gone on for too long. NATO, which used to stop at West Germany, has now expanded all the way to the borders of the former Soviet Union and of today's Russia. And the message is Ukraine is a bridge too far. NATO must not expand into Ukraine. This, I love this graphic because it sort of shows the world as seen from Russia, right? Everything, all these American flags, everything that, that NATO or the United States does around the world is perceived by Russia as an attempt to surround Russia, even if from the United States perspective, we don't intend that at all. Now, how do things look from Ukraine? Well, pretty bleak. Uh, Ukraine, in fact, is surrounded. There are Russian troops on all of its borders now. Uh, the Ukrainian military is practically non-existent. That's a photo that I took in Odessa in May of the Ukrainian Navy. Uh, and the reason that that's the Ukrainian Navy, and you can see it's kind of sad, right? The biggest ship has masks. That's kind of a bad sign in the 21st century. Um, and the reason that that's all that's left is because when Crimea went to the Russians, the Ukrainian Navy went with it. But more troubling than the boats themselves is the personnel, the commander, the, the admiral in charge of the entire Ukrainian Navy actually joined the Russians when given the opportunity to become the deputy commander of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. This gives you a sense of how Ukrainians think about their own military. As much patriotism, uh, as much national pride as there is in Ukraine, uh, there's not any good reason to have confidence that the Ukrainian military is an effective fighting force. It's been subject to the very same corruption that all of Ukraine has for the last 25 years. Of course, the rebels that we've been hearing about they now hold a pretty significant swath of territory in the southeast of the country. Uh, moreover, they control the border between Ukraine and Russia, and that's important. And they threaten critical points like Mariupol, which is uh, the, uh, the port through which all the industrial production of this part of Ukraine has been shipped out. Um, there's also a kind of rock and a hard place problem, right? So the, the Ukrainians are facing pressure from the Russians and from the Russian-backed separatist movement, but at the same time, they're up against the pressure of radical nationalists in their own politics. So when they held an election last October, of all of the parties elected, only 7.5%, one party, represents people from the Southeast who speak Russian. Everyone else sent to parliament largely represents strongly nationalist, anti-Russian Ukrainian parties. The problem with that is, at the end of the day, unless you do commit this genocide that Putin is warning about, you're going to have to figure out a way for Ukrainians and Russians to live together in that country. And if you don't have enough legitimate political representatives in the parliament who can talk to each other, if you have an overwhelming lopsided parliament that is 90-10 radical nationalists, it really narrows the room for maneuver for Ukraine's leadership. 
And of course, the rock in a hard place, Russia dominates the Russian-speaking airwaves. Ukraine has never for 50 years invested in Ukrainian language television, and ordinary people watch television. They're not reading newspapers, they don't have internet access, they watch television, and that means they get Putin's message. The Russians, of course, also control uh, oil and gas supplies to Ukraine, which no matter how cheap gas becomes in the international market or oil becomes, uh, Ukraine still needs those Russian supplies, as does the rest of Europe, and the pipelines largely flow from Russia through Ukraine, which means if the Russians decide to cut off the tap at the source, they can do so. In terms of this rock in a hard place, again, this is what the Maidan looked like shortly after the ouster of Yanukovych last year. It was then completely cleared. But when I talked to veterans of the Maidan, like this fellow here, guy not to be trifled with, um, he looks like he'd be on a duck hunting show, right? <laughs> they said one thing very clearly, which is this is not the end of the Maidan revolution, okay? Yes, we have a new parliament. Yeah, we have a new president. But if these people betray our values, if they betray the Ukrainian nation, we will remove them from power just like we removed Yanukovych. So there's a kind of permanent state of threat hanging over the Ukrainian leadership. And then, of course, there's the Ukrainian economy, which last year declined more than 10%. Right? Try to imagine that. We've never had that experience in the United States since the Great Depression. And this year is set to decline even more. Remember, they're losing an entire region of their country, one of the major industrial regions. All the tax revenue is gone. Airports, ports, roads, highways, everything destroyed. So Ukraine is in an extremely difficult position. You can see its foreign currency reserves are down to almost nothing. And if you, foreign currency reserves for a nation are like your bank account, right? If you're out of money in your bank account, you can't pay the rent, you can't buy food. The Ukrainian government within a month is not going to have enough money to pay its salaries, to pay pensions to elderly people, to keep the lights on in universities and government ministries, and by the way, to pay its soldiers, right? So this is a country that is literally on the brink of catastrophe at the same time that its currency has inflated almost 100%. So this is the guy, Petro Poroshenko, president of Ukraine, who's supposed to solve all these problems. Um, not really a new face. He used to work for Yanukovych, the old guy. There's Poroshenko looking somewhat morose. There's Yanukovych. Um, and plenty of old faces are around, too. This is Igor Kolomoisky, one of the wealthiest men in Ukraine, known as an oligarch. He has a private army of about 30 or 40,000 people. They're loyal to him. He pays for them out of his private fortune. Just another one of those swords hanging over the Ukrainian government's head, if they ever disagree with him. Uh, all of the media in the country is owned by people like Kolomoisky and Poroshenko, which means you can never really get truly unbiased information from the press in Ukraine. Of course, when Poroshenko was invited to the United States to enjoy the unique honor of speaking before a joint session of Congress. He used the opportunity for, to ask for weapons. Um, we can talk more in the, in the Q&A about whether it would be a good idea to send weapons to Ukraine. I would simply suggest uh, at this point pouring fuel on a fire is going to make the fire burn a lot hotter. So what actually should we do? Uh, I would suggest that we should uh, know something about the place we're getting into. So definitely not do what the Assistant Secretary of State famously did last winter. She arrived on the Maidan where people were protesting for freedom and human rights and democracy. And many of those people were wearing expensive winter clothing, showing that they're not exactly poor. And she went and handed out cookies, right, as if these people were starving. Uh, it sort of makes the United States look very out of touch. We need to know what's going on on the ground. So when there's a disaster like uh, a, a fire in Odessa, last year that burned uh, several dozen people alive, that it doesn't get manipulated by the Russian press and turned into what they called it, which was a fascist Nazi atrocity, as if people had been intentionally locked in the building and burned to death. We need eyes on the border between Ukraine and Russia. We need to know what's actually transiting that border region. Um, and we need to think very hard about the implications of our statements. When President Obama says we have imposed sanctions on Russia, or costs as he calls them, but they're sanctions, and they're working, and they're ensuring that a big country can no longer bully a small country. We need to think about whether that's really true. Sanctions can do three things, in my view. One, they can send a moral message. I think we've done that. Two, they can try to change the behavior of the person being targeted or the country being targeted. That clearly hasn't happened. And three, they can try to so weaken that country uh, that the regime actually collapses. None of those things have happened, and none of those things are going to happen. Because in Russia, when you oppose the regime, you end up like Mikhail Khodorkovsky, 
who used to be the wealthiest man in Russia but spent more than 10 years in a Siberian jail. But when you're friends with power, like Igor Sechin here, you become the wealthiest man in Russia. It's a very clear message. Um, Russians are not, in fact, suffering as badly as the president suggests. Um, that's just a photo I took on the street in Moscow. That is a very common scene, by the way, Mercedes, Bentley, etc. cetera. Uh, and those things don't go away, right? You know, six months of sanctions doesn't make the Mercedes go poof, right? Um, and Russians aren't starving. They, they grow plenty of food and agricultural products at home. This is a propaganda television show talking about how unhealthy it is to eat Western food products and how Russian food products are much, much healthier. So there's a kind of backlash. Um, shirts, t-shirts, and uh, posters glorifying Putin, how strong Putin is. He's the only one who can defend us. Uh, they're a hot-selling item on the streets of Moscow. And then, of course, there's the China factor, right? The Chinese are thrilled with this downturn in relations between Russia and the West because it's a great opportunity for them to snap up inexpensive Russian raw materials at bargain basement prices, and the Russians are happy to sell to them. And, of course, Russia really is the world's biggest energy supplier. No matter how you slice the cake, no matter how cheap oil and gas get, Russia still has the stuff. Russia will be an energy superpower in the future. In the longest of long term, what I think is needed for Ukraine is to try to turn around this line, right? Ukrainians today are poorer and more backwards than they were in 1991. Whereas you compare that to Poland, the dark colored line here, Poland undertook difficult reforms early on, immediately after regaining their independence. And for that, they benefited in the long term. For Ukraine, the number one reform is anti-corruption. Here you see the Transparency International ratings rate Ukraine as the most corrupt country in the entire post-Soviet space. That is an incredibly telling statistic, more corrupt than Azerbaijan, Belarus, Armenia, Moldova, right? Ukraine is a deeply corrupt place and that needs to be fixed. And then lastly, I would say the role that we in the United States need to play is by opening up to Ukrainians so that they actually understand what it is to live in a society with rule of law, right? We need to bring Ukrainians over here. I'm not saying unlimited immigration, I'm simply saying visas, right? They can be very difficult to get and vice versa. And it would make sense for the United States to invest in study and scholarship and language training about this region so that we have more than a small handful of people who know what's actually going on. And here I'm sorry to tell you all the U.S. government programs that used to invest in this region, and I'm not talking about a lot of money, this is a few million dollars, money that falls off the back of the truck at the Pentagon, M many of them have been eliminated altogether. Of course, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the famous Soviet dissident, warned us more than 30 years ago that there might be a war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but he said, and I, and I quote here, whatever voice and weight I have, I shall apply it to this end. I know one thing, should there arise, God forbid, a Russo-Ukrainian war, I won't join it myself and I won't let my sons go. And those are words that I hope we can remember at this moment when we're talking about literally throwing weapons into a war between Russia and Ukraine. And I hope that we'll exercise just a little bit of patience. Thank you. States if they didn't think we could give it. So there's no question that the United States is, is very much looked to as the kind of uh, partner of first resort. Certainly in Europe, um, for many of our allies in the Middle East and Asia. I do think we have a problem in that uh, even though the United States is the most powerful country on earth, it remains so, right? And we've been growing. It's not like we've been declining. The rest of the world is growing faster than they ever were. And what that means is our ability to dictate outcomes, to say, you know, we're the big dog on the block, is not the same as it was in, say, 1992. One of the problems that I see in Washington today, and this is a problem on both sides of the aisle politically, is a mindset that's stuck in the 1990s, that's stuck in this unique moment when we were the world's hyperpower, when no one could hold a candle to us. The reality is if you look at China, or if you look at Russia, or if you look at India, or Brazil, or any number of rising powers, and you add up their economies, they dwarf us, they overwhelm us. And that wasn't true 20 years ago, but it's true today. 
That doesn't mean we need to be in conflict with these folks. It simply limits our ability to dictate outcomes around the world. Because all it takes is one country, one major player like Russia, that says, no, we don't agree. And then the Chinese just gradually begin to shift a little bit of resources in that direction. They say, you know, we kind of like that, someone standing up to the Americans. And then the Indians come along, and the Brazilians, and the South Africans, and pretty soon, you have a pretty considerable you know, rest uh, that isn't in the West. And, and they have enough wealth and power now to do things on their own. So it seems to me that maybe they've lost a lot of respect around the world. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I, I travel a whole lot in a lot of places, and I think, you know, the United States is still very widely respected. And I'm, I'm proud to be an American everywhere I go. Um, but on the other hand, I think what, what people would appreciate most of all is if we actually understood what was going on in their parts of the world. I think the biggest problem that people have with the United States, with Americans, uh, is this sense that we, we do wade into global crises, we give big speeches about who's right and who's wrong, and then we send weapons or we send money or we send advisors or what have you without fully understanding what happened. You know, I'll just, I'll just throw this in there. A question was asked last night, shouldn't we think about this conflict in Ukraine just like the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the 1980s? We sent missiles to help the Mujahideen, the Afghan resistance, fight the Soviets, and we turned Afghanistan into their Vietnam, right? A quagmire, they lost so many people. You know, wasn't that a great victory for the United States in the Cold War? My answer to that was, yeah, I guess, for the United States. It was horrible for Afghanistan. And by the way, remember the Mujahideen? Where do you think Osama bin Laden came from? Right? So it's not fully understanding these situations before we wade into them and not understanding the unintended consequences. Thank you, sir. Others? Yes. In this, uh, if you want this conflict class from America, we, we, we were talking about the funds that fall on the back of the front of the Pentagon and how few they are to actually learn something about this. You know, we haven't spent the last 200 years being Africa's friends, building up their infrastructure and educating them and giving them medicine. We do the same thing with European countries until they're in conflict. We don't have anything to do with them. We don't know their culture. We don't help them. We don't apply assistance. But we're giving away a lot of free bombs and bullets to the Afghans and the Iraqis, which I'm sure they don't But we're not giving them medicine and being, we're not being a good neighbor, a good uh, international neighbor yeah. before these things happen. So, so my recommendation on Ukraine would be that we, we sort of practice what we preach, um, which is, you know, if, if what we want to see is a Ukraine, now again, remember, Ukraine's already in Europe, right? So the notion that this is some like really far away place that's not connected to the American, you know, we're doing a free trade agreement right now with the European Union, and Ukraine is right next door to the European Union. So if Ukraine trades with the European Union, then anything they produce or anyone who comes from there can come freely into here, right? That's how free trade works. So it would make a lot of sense for the United States to think about Ukraine as a kind of extension of the westernized part of the global economy that is really critical to us. So when there was a European financial crisis a couple of years ago, and it started to affect American markets and the welfare of Americans, you know, we got involved because we had to, because we had no choice. And I think we need to think about helping get Ukraine through this crisis, not with weapons, you know, not military. Because there's, there is no military solution, by the way, just, just to be very clear. Ukraine isn't Afghanistan. Even if we give them all the missiles in the world, they're not going to beat the Russians because there are 145 million more of those Russians where, where, the, where the previous ones came from. And there is no number of, of, of body count that will convince the Russians that this historic kind of core of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union uh, isn't important to them. So it would be it would be foolhardy to pursue the military option further, uh, but we need to think very seriously about the economic option. And the question that I asked the people who have been advocating sending weapons in Washington for the last two weeks, there's been a huge push. Um, you know, a majority of the Senate and the House have signed on to this thing. The president has said he's considering it. Uh, they're talking about three billion dollars worth of weapons a year uh, from now for a period of several years. The question I ask them is, are you prepared to send $3 billion worth of financial assistance? How about just a $3 billion loan, you know, on commercial terms to be paid back? Um, and so far, the United States hasn't been willing to do any of that. We have given a $1 billion loan guarantee, which those of you who are taking out loans to, to for your education, you'll know it's like getting your parents to co-sign a loan. They don't actually put any money up. So that, that guarantee only costs us, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. That's it. That's what we've given the Ukrainians. 
I know some students wonder uh, if the U.S. does give weapons to Ukraine, is there any likelihood that Russia would go to war with the U.S.? Yeah, in fact, I've, I've heard uh, senior officials in Washington acknowledge that one of the biggest problems with supplying uh, American weapons to Ukraine is the perception that it will create in Russia that all bets are off. Because once Russia and the United States are really at war, right, in a proxy war or a direct conflict, uh, this is the nightmare scenario that we tried to avoid for half a century during the Cold War, right? And no one ever intends to escalate. No one ever, you know, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, when he put missiles in Cuba in the 1960s, he never said, I want this to be a nuclear war, right? He simply wanted to gain the upper hand against the United States, but then things escalated and we came very close to obliterating life on this planet as we know it, right? That is entirely possible again. Russia is the only country on earth that has the ability in less than 30 minutes to wipe out every city in the United States. So don't think you're safe in Western Michigan because you're not. They have 3,000 nuclear warheads. The idea is we cannot afford to be in a conflict with Russia, in a proxy conflict or any other kind. Does it mean we give in, we roll over, we say, ah, take Ukraine, take whatever you want? No. Right? But there are other means, and I would argue that at least taking the problem seriously in Ukraine and supporting them economically, socially, and in other ways right now would be a lot smarter than throwing fuel on this fire. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, a lot of information, a lot of insight. Uh, thank you for clarifying a lot for us and answering a lot of questions.